Welcome to the Armor Report. Everybody, thanks for joining me. It's Saturday. It's another week in review. I'm your host, Brett Rosenthal. Those of you who don't know, this is a show about stock market investing. You all probably know that already. Um, quantum mental investing. It's what we do here on our trading desk. It's what I'm sharing with you. It's the combination of quantitative execution, a fundamental foundation, and that's what creates the information edge that I share every time I come on this channel. Um, what does it mean? It means we're executing using algorithms. So we take the emotion out of the buy and sell decision, but we use fundamental research to build a whiteboard of ideas that we want to own. And then we just wait for the algo to tell us now's the time to put the money to work. And then we religiously follow stops, principal protection, raise stops, profit protection. That's what we're talking about here today. So um, another huge week, right? We're just, we're just knocking it down every week. So we're going to go over some of the things that happened this week and then what we think is going to happen next week and how we're preparing the desk. A um, couple ground rules. Don't forget, all this information I'm sharing is information I use my own personal portfolio and for investors I manage capital for through our interactive brokers relationship. This is also information that I'm sharing uh, on a um, real-time basis with Armor subscribers, which I call Armor Insiders. Now, if you want to be an Armor Insider, um, join us on our Slack chat trading desk every day while the market's open. Um, get updates every night with uh, portfolio changes, whether we're adding or reducing what our stops are, what our entry prices are, all these things. You could subscribe right down here, both to this YouTube channel, but also to the Armor Report. It's armorreport.com. It stands for Algorithmic Risk Management Research. That's what we're all about. So all of our decisions when we manage money has to do with managing risk first. We want to get on the right side of probabilities and statistics, and we want to put capital to work when the reward is worth the risk. And I'm going to share chart patterns with you today that... Uh, illustrate that process. Okay, so um, if you enjoy this conversation, of course, you know, give me a like. That always helps out. And um, like I said, subscribe if you'd like. All right, now let's get to business. Of course, I'll get to questions at the end of this. So I'm just going to talk to you briefly about, you know, what it is I'm thinking on the desk, how I'm preparing myself for next week, and then we'll get to questions. So feel free to load up the board and I'll just walk through them. So the first thing I want to start with, as usual, is stock market direction. Um, I've been reading this is the most hated rally in history. Um, I watch CNBC all day, unfortunately. I mute it most of the time. But uh, everybody on there is talking about the market can't go any higher. The market has to go lower. The market has to retest the lows. All of these things. Now, last week I shared with you on this show, and then I sent out an email to everybody who's on the Armor Action Alert free email list. You just go to the armorreport.com, there's the link. It's a free email list. And I sent out a, a definitive discussion on what I think is happening right now in the stock market with a picture of the S&P 500, the ETF SPY, from 2009 through 2010. Okay, And what I said last week on the show, and I'm going to repeat it real quick for those of you who missed it, is that liquidity is what drives the stock market. It's not valuations. It's not the economy. I heard people were concerned about the non-farm payrolls number. There's no reason to be concerned about economic numbers ever. It's got nothing to do with why the market goes up and down. Sorry, I know they taught you something different in university, but they just don't know what they're talking about in university. Okay, that's not what drives stocks. What drives stocks is liquidity. Okay, so um, we're going we're gonna to knock down some of these um, old adages you hear. Don't fight the Fed. But what the heck does that mean? What it means is when the Fed's adding liquidity, markets go higher. So you don't need to start calling tops. You don't have to start worrying about massive breakdowns or bear markets if the Fed is adding liquidity. Caveat. This discussion I'm having with you has nothing to do with swing trading, nothing to do with a 5 to 10% correction. 
the market can have a 5 or 10% correction anytime it wants. It just did it two weeks ago. The small cap index went down 10% in three days from high to low. It can happen at any time. So that's, that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the bigger picture of should we invest or should we be raising cash? And so what I said last week, if you remember, rule number 25 on the Armor Investing Rules of the Road, you can find this on the website, um, rule 25, I went over with you last week, it's the rule of three, and boy did it work like a charm again this week. So Thursday, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of the prior week, the market sold off hard. And I said to you last Saturday, two down days means nothing to me in an overall trend. This is true about downtrends or uptrends. You can have a counter trend rally for two days in a row. It means nothing. It's normal volatility meant to shake you out. If you get three days in a row, then you have to start raising cash and realizing that the trend you've been riding may be changing. So I said, watch out Monday morning. It'll gap down. It might freak you out. I don't care about the open Monday morning. What I care about is the close. And we closed higher at the end of the day Monday. And of course, we had a huge run into the end of the week on Friday. So um, what I want to say to you today is trying to call a market top. How do you call a market top? And I say, don't do it. Don't try to do it. Okay? If you're worried about a 5 or 10% swing in the market that happens real quick, I get it. Okay, you could do some things to, you know, manage your risk if you want. But from a bigger picture standpoint, the Fed is adding liquidity at a rate never seen before in history. The federal government's adding stimulus in the trillions. This is why the market's going up. It's not hard. They try to make it hard on financial news networks so you keep watching. They try to make it confusing so you keep trying to figure out what's happening. That makes TV. It would make it for a very boring, you know, eight-hour show if all they did was tell you the truth, which is the markets go up when the Fed's adding liquidity. You know, show's over. I could walk away right now. We have other things to talk about. Okay? So I don't care about calling a top. I say to myself, I recognize that I'm not going to top tick the market. I don't have to. We're making a killing right now, okay? But I look at that, my portfolio at the end of every day, every week, and I see the profits, and I honestly say to myself, probably 25 to 30% of those profits will be wiped out if the market rips lower and I get stopped out of everything. That's just the way it is. It's still a great profit I've got if I can capture 70 to 75 percent of, of those profits. Do you follow me? And instead of worrying about where the top is, I just keep making money, right? And at some point, I'll get stopped out. It's not emotional. It's about following an algorithmic strategy, a quantum mental strategy to get your emotions out of it. It's much more relaxing and calming and successful if you follow this type of approach, you put positions on your whiteboard that you love. You don't buy them right away. You do research, you put them on the whiteboard. You wait for the quantum mental algos to say, now's the time to put money to work. And I can help you understand how to do that on your own. Of course, at the Armor Report, if you're a subscriber, I share with you what our algorithms are telling us. Right? It's why we were buying stocks on the 23rd you know, of, of, of March. One of the reasons and why we've been loading up in early April and why we've got gains like this. So as a subscriber, I share with you what I'm seeing. But on your own, over time, you're going to learn to buy weakness in the midst of strength. That's the other thing we're going to you know, talk about today, about um, these, these old hackneyed phrases that we hear all the time. Buy low, sell high. That doesn't really help anybody. What does that mean? You can't just buy anything low and sell it high. It doesn't work like that. So what it means is you buy Weakness in the midst of strength. Let's take a second to go look at a chart to understand what I mean. Okay, this is a chart of Chegg. All of you following me know I've been following the stock. I showed you a perfect cup and handle. So what this, buying weakness in the midst of strength, this is the ideal chart to understand what that means. 
The strength is the cup and handle chart pattern. That's a strong pattern. The weakness we're buying is the downtrending handle that breaks out. Okay. Now, William O'Neill, whom I love, and anybody who wants to read his book, please feel free to hop over to the website, armorreport.com. You'll see a link. You can click on it. It takes you right to Amazon. Okay. You can buy the book. It's a fantastic book. But what he'll tell you is on Chegg, the buy point or what he calls the pivot point is up here as it's breaking out above 45. Well, number one, you would have missed it because it was a massive gap up on earnings. So you don't even get the trade. And number two, I don't like to buy breakouts. I want to buy weakness in the midst of strength. That's what we were doing in Chegg. And we have a 70% return in 11 trading days on Chegg. This gets me back to market direction. Is the market topping? I submit to you that bull markets have leadership and the leadership is traditionally technology, uh, um, explosive growth, um, disruptive growth type of stocks. Those stocks are exploding right now. And they're all in our portfolio. Armor portfolios are full of them. I'm going to go over three more charts of stocks in our portfolios. I'm going to show you why we bought them early and why they're all up now. There's one particular rule that we follow on this desk that works like a charm. I'm going to share it with you a little bit later. Okay. But just to focus on the market right now, I'm not trying to call a top. I understand that the market could drop five or 10% tomorrow, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It can do that if it wants. I, I can't help that. That's normal volatility. But the bigger picture is liquidity and that liquidity keeps coming in. When will I start getting nervous about the market? Two times. Two things will happen. Number one, we will be so far above the 200-day moving average, standard deviation-wise, more than three, maybe four standard deviations above the 200-day on the S&P. Usually three is the mark. That's why I start getting nervous because there's that mean reversion trade takes you back down. Let's see where we are right now on the S&P. Oops, that's not the S&P. Okay, we're below the 200-day moving average. This line right here is the exponential 200-day. We're below it. The reason we were getting a little more uncomfortable up here and why we went to 100% cash on the 24th in our index-only portfolios and quickly in the other portfolios the next couple of days is because we were so far above the 200-day. And so there's that mean reversion trade. Okay, now we're back to it. So there's no real pull one way or the other. And I want to just share with you where we are today. See where we're at? We're right at that 200 day. Now let's take a look at 2000. Ah, hang on a second. Bear with me. I want to show you this. This is going to be a worthwhile discussion here. In case you haven't seen it already. This is the S&P. We're going to go back to... Uh, Crash of 2008, 2009, and 2010, okay? The reason I look at this is because this is the last time we had massive Fed intervention like we're getting now. And actually now it's bigger than it was then. So this green box is where I think we are today in this market rally, okay? We're right up to it. We're right back up to the 200-day moving average. Notice how it does pull back. It does consolidate. That's totally possible. But was it a reason to get short? Was it a reason to sell all your winners if they stayed above the stop? No, it wasn't. Market dramatically went higher um, going forward. So I don't know what the market's going to do right now. Nobody does. This is, you know, uh, history rhymes. It doesn't repeat. Okay. Um, but we're right at the 200-day moving average. It could pause here. It could have some trouble. I get it. And I'm going to share with you a little bit later what I do in my own personal portfolio to hedge that risk. But for right now, I'm just talking big picture. I'm not trying to call a top. All right. Um, I just wanted to share this thought with you, too, as I wrap up here. You know, everyone says the market climbs a wall to worry. So this is the third thing now. We're going to, we're going to try to put that, <laughs> that 
old hackneyed phrase in, and into something that's actually useful to you. Okay? Um, what that really means is all the way up, people are going to tell you why it can't go higher. And I think that's just because it's human emotion. And I have rule number 20 um, in the Armor Investing Rules of the Road. And, it, and, and I say, please don't fall victim to this classic investor problem, which is to say you become comfortable with failure and you can't stand success. It's just a human emotion. It's just a human nature. I don't know why it's like that. It's what makes investing so hard. You have to get through that. Never become comfortable with failure. Cut your losses immediately. Okay? But then you've got to stay with your successes as long as possible. You've got to get while the getting's good. And that's why you don't want to overfocus on calling a market top. Because most people can't call market top and they just miss massive upside. Okay? Do not become comfortable with failure and, and, and hate the success you're having. Just let the algos run. Let your trailed stops run. Take your emotion out of it. Let it go. See how much money you make. When the whole thing's over, you'll get stopped out, just like we did the 24th of February. Right? Everything went negative. We got stopped out of everything in two or three trading days. It was ugly. It was ugly. It wasn't pleasant. Wow, it was a pretty ugly sell-off, for, even for us. Right? And then the market cratered, and our alpha went like this because we sold correctly using stops. We didn't ask questions why. We weren't comfortable with the failure and said, okay, we'll wait for it, wait for it. No. Algo tells us it's quantum mental investing. It's powerful. All right. Um, let's move on. Um, quick thought I had for you. I'm going to try to make this real brief. We could talk about it more if you want to. Some of you guys were asking me about the tanker stocks, okay, oil tankers because oil had collapsed, USO, and things went negative on the oil futures market, and so tankers are in, 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 in short supply, and the day rates are going through the roof. Um, and it brings to mind for me rule number 21 on the Armour Investing Rules of the Road, and that is if everybody can see the investing idea, it's probably not a good investing idea. What I mean by that is, and I like to say this, every single time, a hurricane barrels down on Florida. People run out there on CNBC and say, you got to buy Home Depot. Okay, look, it's a trade. It might work for a week or two, but it's not a reason to invest in a company. And so this is why I've avoided tankers so far. And they ran up, which was a trade, and then they've collapsed back down. If the day rate story is legitimate and it can remain high, for a long period of time, there might be an investing idea there. And I'm still researching that, okay? I might want to own some of these names because a good day rate story, um, a good day rate story is, is, is powerful for a stock, okay? But so I'm just going to show you this chart real quick. I know you guys have been asking me about it. So this is STNG, right? Scorpio, Tankers, they all look pretty much the same. So here's the run up to the 200-day moving average on the excitement of day rates. And here's the sell-off because everybody realizes that that excitement is fleeting. They announced earnings. The earnings looked pretty good. The stocks went down anyway because the guys who ran it up are just trading. They're just day trading or you know quick swing trades on, a, on, a, on an issue that everybody can see. So if you bought these stocks early before the week where USO went negative and the futures went big time negative, you could have made a lot of money on the run. But you had to book your gain because that thought is a trading idea. It's not an investing idea. Okay? Um, quick, let's skip over to uh, silver and gold. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, but I want to get to your questions. But God knows... There is um, a huge bull market going on in the metals. Um, anybody who is not aware of the Armour Report, feel free to become a subscriber, log in. You'll see where we bought these stocks. We were buying gold and the mining stocks and silver the 23rd of March when the Fed started to buy every asset in sight. 
Okay, so the first thought we had was gold and silver are going to be the best performing group right now because there's a complete um, um, you know, out-of-body experience going on in the Fed. I mean, the, the destruction of fiat currency is, around the world is disturbing. And so the best way to play it, in our opinion, is precious metals. Now, people ask me, what about Bitcoin? Um, I, I don't have an opinion on Bitcoin. If you want to try it, if you want to trade it, have at it. I, I'm not going to say no, because theoretically, it follows the same idea of fiat currencies in demise, in decline. And so there's the rise of the gold and silver. And who knows, maybe Bitcoin will work. Um, I like to play in areas where there's a lot of liquidity, where I can move a lot of uh, um, uh, assets in and out um, with a fair amount of certainty that the prices will be relatively normal from one night to the next. I don't have that in Bitcoin. I don't know what's going to happen one night to the next. You wake up, all of a sudden Bitcoin's down 15%. I, I mean, I, I can't move a lot of money into that space. So that's why I don't play there. But feel free, guys. I mean, theoretically, Bitcoin should be in the same category, perhaps, as gold and silver if fiat currencies are, are, are um, you know, having their long walk back to the middle. You know what I'm saying? If that's what's happening, if fiat currencies are slowly deteriorating and there's inflation and these type of things that are coming, who knows, Bitcoin might work. But for my money, I'm focused on gold and silver. And I just shared with you all Again, if you're a subscriber to the free Armor Report Action Alerts, I sent out um, chart patterns just yesterday, and I shared with you this chart pattern. I want to show it to everybody uh, watching today so you guys can see this in case you didn't get the free, the free email. You can subscribe right down there in the description section, armorreport.com. But um, I just put up SLV, and I showed the monthly chart of S. First of all, there's the daily chart of SLV. So what you're seeing here is a pennant that's breaking out above the 50-day moving average. Okay, something like this. Okay, don't forget, technical analysis is an art, not a science. Okay, so don't be too rigid there. So there's a, a the short-term breakout in silver. It looks like it's literally just beginning. But I want to show you this monthly chart. Okay, it hasn't even started yet, guys. Look at where silver's trading. This goes back to 2011 when silver traded up as high as $50 an ounce. Okay, massive downtrend. We got the Fibonacci fan resistance uh, arc, which is right here showing us that we've broken the downtrend. Then we consolidated for the last few years doing nothing. This, the silver bullet train doesn't even get started until it breaks above the top of this pattern. Right here is at the bottom of the pattern. Okay, so I'm not a buyer of SLV. I'm just sharing this chart with you so you can see what silver really looks like. Um, so I don't buy SLV. I'm not going to get into the reasons why right now. You all who know me know that I like to sprout physical funds. So that's SP, uh, um, PSLV. Um, and quite frankly, I like the mining companies that mine silver. Um, those are kind of my favorite names. And Armor Insiders, you guys know what those stocks are. They're on the portfolios, um, you know, and, you know, they're breaking out. So these are the stocks, you know, that I'm focused on, on top of what we already own in the gold space from early on. Um, so I just want to put that in perspective for you. Then I'm going to wrap up with this and I'll get to your questions. I promised you I was going to share with you chart you know, let's call this the chart chat part of the section. Okay, chart chat. I'm going to show you three charts. And they're all disruptive growth stocks. They're all in armor portfolios. We're up a lot on all of these names. But I want to show you today why we were buying them. One major reason. And it's called relative strength. These are three perfect examples of how relative strength breaks out before the stock price goes up. It's literally um, as close to you're ever going to get uh, to a crystal ball. I, I mean, you need the market to go up. You need things to work, right? So it's not a crystal ball and doesn't always work. 
But if you're in a bull market and you can identify stocks where the relative strength of the stock versus the market is breaking out to new highs before the stock price, it's a stock you should be focusing on. So you already have your whiteboard set up, which we did, all of our favorite disruptive growth stocks, which you can find on the armorreport.com. We have the armor whiteboard, all the stocks we're doing research on. Um, and so then we wait and we watch for some names and we look at the relative strengths. And when they start breaking out before the prices, that's when we get interesting and the algos kick in. So I'm going to show you those charts right now. And I'm going to show you William O'Neill charts. All right. So um, let's start with um, Slack. Oops. Let me start with, start with Slack here, okay? So as you can see on that chart, <clears throat> I, I drew a line for you. That green line um, is connecting all of the tops of the relative strength line. The relative strength line is that blue line below the price chart, okay? Um, and if you go all the way to the right of the chart, it says RS rating 92 on uh, uh, on Slack. I hope you all can see that. RS rating 92. So that solid blue line is the relative strength line. What I'm doing is connecting the tops. And what you'll see in um, late March is that the relative strength of work broke out before the stock. And that leads to the strength that we're seeing, and now the stock is breaking out to new highs. That relative strength line broke out above the highs of, what is that, last, last September, well before the stock has broken out. Okay? Let me show you another name. By the way, this name we own at 2373. Bought it at 2373. Stock is over 31 now. Okay, take a look at Team, T E A M. Again, relative strength line 95. Okay, but what, what is important to me is that green highlight. Before the price ever broke out to a new high, the relative strength line, it's even more obvious on Team, broke out to a new high. It led the stock price. Okay, and let's wrap up with this one. VEEV. Again, look where the stock was when the relative strength line, which is a 94 now, broke out to all-time new highs. Look at that green line. It takes you all the way back to look at the relative strength. Okay, when it, it broke out to new highs. The stock was not at a new high yet. Now the stock's at all-time new highs. Okay, this is a classic, classic way um, for you to identify 90. chart patterns that um, identify chart patterns where the price is yet to break out, but you're getting a clear indication that the relative strength, which is showing you that institutions are piling into the stock, even though it hasn't made new highs yet, is a coil. It's building. So there's my gift to you today of technical analysis and, and how we, part of what we do on our, um, with our quantum, quantum mental algorithms to help us put money to work. All right, that about wraps it up. Let's go to the questions and see if we can't knock down some thoughts here. Thanks for spending time with me today. All right, a couple good mornings. Good morning to you guys. All right. Um, Mr. Gregory, this is a major week this year. It looks like we're going to have a, a, one for the history books. Possible. It's possible. All right. Um, cannabis Couch. Cannabis Couch. Tech Monkey, you always loved Cannabis Couch. All right, let's do it. Um, can't stand the things that I saw this week. Right? Can't stand them. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell... The only stock I think worth owning in the Canadian cannabis space continues to be, like I've been saying for weeks, canopy growth. And even that's not making money. 
right? I'm on that trade and it's just flatlining, okay? But it's better than the other names, right? We, we're, Afria makes that ridiculous, I, I shouldn't call it ridiculous. I, I don't know what's going on in the business. Afria sees something that is disturbing. I shouldn't call it ridiculous, actually. We should take what Afria did on Friday and we should perhaps wonder if they're seeing something about the Canadian cannabis business that's disturbing. Because they exercise, they didn't exercise, they retired um, convertible debt. This was confusing to a lot of people. Why the stock go down? They were Because the, the headline was they retired debt to shore up their balance sheet. But the real read, first of all, when they retired that convert, they increased the float 7%. What that, what that means is they retired the debt and they gave the debt holders stock. Okay, so now there's more stock on the uh, trading on the exchange. It's almost like a secondary offering. And it was a 7% increase to the flow, which is why the stock was down about 7%. So that's the simple reason why the stock was down. But what disturbed me about that deal, they said they wanted to improve their cash position, their net cash position. So they had $515 million of cash in the balance sheet, but their net cash, which is X, um, um, uh, the debt, was only $36 million and they wanted to increase it to something like $127 million or $138 million, something like that. Shores up their balance sheet. My question to you is, why do they feel they had to shore up the balance sheet? Cash flow is not going to be there for the next 6 to 12 months? I mean, you, you, the cash out of the business can't service the debt? This is what's disturbing to me. And then I saw late Friday, um, uh, thanks to an Armour Insider who sent me this uh, message in the Slack room. So anybody who's an Armour Insider gets access to the Slack room. And so all day long we're sharing information about the companies we're trading. And of course I'm sharing information about the stocks we're buying or selling and the prices and all those kinds of things. So I appreciate the Insider who sent me this. Um, they're cutting workforce. They're, you know, completely, you know, shuttering some businesses. I mean, it, it seems very disturbing to me that Afria would feel they had to shore up their balance sheet. They have five hundred and fifteen million dollars in the balance sheet, and they need to shore it up. And they do it by diluting shareholders. That's why the stock was down. Then we saw Kronos earnings announcement was just absolutely dismal. And it, I'll tell you, I won't. I've been saying this for a while and I'm saying it again. I won't touch that stock until the CEO is gone and they put in somebody else. I don't know why Altria hasn't done it already. They see the footprint, right? Constellation Brands did that with Canopy Growth. Now they got a good guy running the company who's slashing costs and getting cash flow positive. I think that'll be the first company that gets cash flow positive. So that's why it's the only stock I'm willing to even look at right now. Okay, and I much rather focus on the U.S. cannabis business. So we saw earnings announcement out of um, IIPR, which is uh, one of my favorites, the the real estate investment trust, um, uh, innovative properties. Some couple quick highlights about um, that earnings announcement. There were four properties that they um, adjusted rent payment on because of the Wuhan virus and delays. Um, by the way, they got paid. All four of those um, um, leases, they, were, they took money from um, the security deposit to pay. And they're gonna do that for the next three months. And then the companies all agreed that they'll replenish that security deposit as soon as they can. And they believe that all they need is three months to get back on track. The economy's opening here again in the US. Um, two of the four properties were literally in the middle of construction and construction had to stop because you couldn't get a construction worker to get on site. So forget about all the conspiracy theorists uh, and the short sellers or whatever. There's nothing wrong with this company. They're doing business correctly. Um, they, 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 they said that their order book is, is exploding. I mean, the backlog of business they can do is exploding right now. So a lot of cannabis companies want access to the triple lease backs that they're offering. Um, I think they have like 100 and 
$30 million of cash in the balance sheet. I still think they're going to do a secondary. So I've stayed out of the stock, waiting for them to announce the secondary. So they raise more cash. Usually the stock drops 15%. That'll be the time I jump into the stock. And I don't see any urgency to get in now. And I was right because the stock you know, went down on earnings. Um, because it's a REIT, guys. At the end of the day, REITs are having serious trouble in the world we live in because tenants can't pay. So, um, but the stock, let's, look at, let's take a look at the stock, though. You know, the stock held up well. Don't forget, we bought it here. We sold it up here. We had a real nice profit. Um, stock cratered. All right, now it's flatlining. And actually, it held up real well after that earnings announcement. Okay? So it's probably a great name, and I'm just trying to find the right way into it. Also, one other very important piece of information on that call. They have one business that's in receivership. So it's a grow facility in California where the company went bankrupt. Now, all of these leases are backed by the license. So if at the end of the day, nobody can pay IIPR, they get the grow license. And the theory there is then they go and find another tenant who will use the license and the property. So um, they're at the very top of the food chain when it comes to bankruptcies. This, this property is in bankruptcy and they keep getting paid. The creditors want to keep paying IIPR because they don't want the lease, um, they don't want the um, license to go to IIPR, right? So they're working it out, it's in restructuring. And they set on the call, they expect a very large USMSO to close a deal in the next couple of weeks to take over that property. If that happens, the shorts don't have a leg to stand on. It's proof of their business model. That would be very bullish, okay? Because people have been watching that closely. What happens if a business goes bankrupt to this company? So, so far they keep getting paid even though it's in restructure and it looks like a property is gonna be taken over, okay? So um, I got my finger on the trigger there. This is the cannabis couch. What stock do I want to own? U.S. cannabis companies. Which one? This is one of them. I haven't bought it yet. Then there's another small cap stock that I do own that I can't share on YouTube because I don't like to share small cap stocks. I don't want to. I don't want to move stocks. I own the stock in my portfolio already, and I don't ever want to be in the position where it appears as if I'm on YouTube telling you to buy a stock that you know pumps up my own returns. So. If you're an Armor Insider, you know what stock I'm talking about. If you want to become a subscriber, right down here, uh, armorreport.com, you'll see what the stock is. And it's, it's my favorite way to play the U.S. cannabis business, quite frankly. I'm not a buyer of the U.S. MSOs because I don't like paying for stocks on the Canadian Stock Exchange. I could be wrong about that, but that's just my stance right now. So I'm finding other ways to do it. Okay, so that wraps up the cannabis couch. Um, what do you think of UAL weakness? U, UAL. United Airlines. Nick's asking me about United Airlines. Nick, I don't want to dissuade you from you know putting a position on, and certainly the stock's down huge, and there could easily be a snapback rally if the economy you know reignites. Um, so this kind of just falls into the category for me of opportunity cost of money. I'm making um, so much more money right now. We are. You're an Armour Insider. Hopefully you're doing it with me in these disruptive growth stocks. So, you know, at the end of the day, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, at the end of the day, here's UAL. So you're asking me about buying off the bottom. I get it. I get it. It looks tantalizing. But what I say to you is, you know, we're buying work right here and the stock's exploding, right? We're buying Chegg right here and the stock's exploding. So will there be a time, you know, it's, I mean, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but it's so much fun, this particular horse. You know, we're buying team right in here and the stock's exploding. So my question to you is, why do I want to tie up capital in UAL right now? It may be the right idea at some point in the future. I just don't feel like it is right now. And my favorite way to play, it's probably not going to be airlines. I think I'd rather own, first of all, you know, I don't own it now, but I like the Disney story. I just feel like this thing is going to work. 
I just feel like Disney down here, I'm going to regret that I don't own it. And I, I don't own it right now, but I feel like I'm going to regret it. But I also like Schlumberger, okay? I, I actually like, I like the energy companies. Oh, that's not it. You know, here's Exxon. You know, here's Chevron. Well, Chevron's already walking up. You know, right? Schlumberger's, you know, these stocks are paying fat dividends. Um, I, I mean, airlines don't, they've never interested me. But energy companies interest me that pay fat dividends. And if the energy price rebounds, the economy gets started, things aren't as bad, energy price rebounds, and we can lock in some dividends in, the, in, in these beat up stocks, I might go there. All right. Um, Afria, any thoughts on Afria convertible debt? Okay, I just explained that, Southeast of 99. Um, oops. Sector, where to? All right. So I went over the cannabis sector with you all already. Let's see. When would you consider, okay, Michael D., when would you consider investing in junior miners? I fear they won't run up until real economy picks up. All right, Mike, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've been grappling with that thought myself. Um, we have some, like we already have, if you're an Armour Insider, guys, you know, we, we have a broad array of stocks that we own. Some of them will be considered junior miners. We have a couple already. We bought them back, you know, in, in the end of March, early April. Um, but most of our capital is focused on the big names. I'm doing research on some companies that are really small cap in nature because if this thing gets rolling, these stocks are going to go up huge. Um, what separates a, a, a junior from major or whatever, to me is there's guys who are in production and then there are guys who are just exploration guys who are gathering um, knowledge of, a, of a, an ore body underground but have yet to take it out of the ground, right? So they're developmental. And those stocks, those companies, um, they're not the first to go up. But when you get into a ripping bull market, boy, they come, I mean, bull market for the metals, they come on like wildfire, you know. So I'm doing research there, but I don't really own a lot of those names yet. Most of the stuff we own, in fact, all but two are producers. We, we do have a couple of, of junior miners in the portfolio. So, um You say you feel they won't run up until the real economy picks up. I don't think it's got anything to do with the economy, though. I don't understand that thought there. The junior gold miners have nothing to do with the economy. They have to do with the price of gold and silver. If the price of gold and silver keeps walking higher, those stocks are going to take off. Okay? Um, let me see. Jim Cramer. Uh, this is from... Uh, Yuguan stock. Jim Cramer had his COVID-19 ETF index. How do you think about his pick? Or do you buy his COVID index? I didn't actually see the whole index of stocks. So um, I feel like that play is, I would have liked to have made all those investments maybe in January, early February. So, you know, um, I'm not chasing COVID-19 stocks right now. We do still own Gilead in the portfolio. We bought it January 27th at 63 and change. Okay, we've already booked profits and repositioned at lower prices. So this is our second or third go around as Armor Insiders would tell you. And I'll just, I'll just share this chart with you. Let's just look at Gilead real quick because you all know I've been talking about it a lot. This stock has, you know, um, been a little bit frustrating to be honest with, with you. Okay, I would have thought all that good news would have put the stock above 90 already. And instead, the stock is languishing a bit. So look, as long as it stays above that 50-day moving average, I'm going to let this thing play out and see where it ends up. If it closes below the 50, that's going to be my stop. I'll be out of this trade and I've just got too many other places to go with money. So um, that's where I stand on that. Um, and you'd have to give me a couple particular names you want me to look at, not just that index. That, that seems like a tired play already to me. Uh, can you compare Teva to INO? Um, Albert, INO. 
I really can't compare the two. Um, but I would say this. Teva, the, the reason to own Teva to me is not because of anything to do with COVID-19, the Wuhan virus. Can we all call it that, please, on this channel? It's a virus that started in China. I don't know why everyone's upset about calling it the Wuhan virus. That's where it started. All right, don't get me started on that issue. Um, so here's Teva. The reason Teva's on the whiteboard has nothing to do with the Wuhan virus. It has to do with this. This is a long-term downtrend. The, the third trend line has been broken now, and the company's in the process of a turnaround. So Teva's interesting to me because it's a turnaround story that had really good earnings, this most recent earnings. You guys should listen to that quarter. It was a good quarter. Okay, I don't know enough about INO to, to give you information there. I can look into it for you, and we can talk about it next week. Or don't forget, write comments Okay, on this um, video, ask me again in the video. Uh, when this video is over, write the comment, and then I'll, I'll answer the comment. Any comments you guys have. If I don't get to all these questions, just feel free to fill up the comments down there, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. All right. Brandon, any other names you're looking at? I know Sienna and INSG. Any other names I'm looking at? I mean, there's a, you know, there's a whole list of names I'm looking at. I've mean, got the armor whiteboard of names that I'm looking at. Um, so I'm not exactly sure your, your question there. Um, but as an Armour Insider, you get to look at all the whiteboard names and you know exactly what I'm looking at. And then I list the top of the whiteboard names, which are names that I think I'm about to call up from the minors to the majors, right? The whiteboard's like the minor leagues. You know, if you're a hockey fan, they're the Hartford Wolf Pack of the New York Rangers, okay? And I'm looking to call them up. Uh, Wiggy, is there a silver miner that you like as much as Newmont as a gold miner? Well, um, I mean, these are two stocks already in the portfolio, okay? Um, so full, full, um, full disclosure, but these are, these are the two best silver plays in my opinion. When we, when we say best, Newmont's a favorite because it's a big cap stock where we're going to see institutional sponsorship. So I've always said that part of the armor investing way is to have us get into investments before institutional funds flow in. And that's what creates big upside over a long period of time. Not day trades or swing trades, but real investing ideas. What you want to do is get in right ahead or as close to or with institutional flow of capital. So um, Newmont was the best way to do that in gold. And I'll share with you um, these, two, these two silver plays. Okay, so this is Wheaton Precious Metals that gets 40% of its, uh, this is a royalty play. They have um, um, royalties on all, a whole bunch of properties and they get 40% of their royalty play from, the, from silver. So we were buying this stock right here, full disclosure, which is you know, April 6th and the stock's up huge already. So I don't know how it's going to help you to, to buy that now, but you're asking me what's a great name like Newmont that benefits from silver. Wheat and Precious is one of them. And then the other, um, the pure silver play has got to be Pan American Silver. This is a pure silver play. And you can see that that's not, you know, that's not in the stratosphere yet. It has yet to make a new high. And it actually had a really dismal earnings announcement and the stock closed up at the end of the day. I think this was on uh, the 7th. As it should, by the way. These stocks don't care about earnings. This is about price of the metal going higher and a lot of asset in the ground. Okay, so those are two big cap ways to play it. And there's other ways, there's other ways, but that answers your question on two names that, that I like there. Um, all right, Telray calls for, for next week. Brandon, you are a, you are a more um, um, aggressive person than I. Okay, there's no way I'm buying uh, calls into uh, earnings after the earnings that I'm seeing coming out. But hey, man, I, I'm not always right, right? I could be wrong. I hope for you that you score right there. I hope for you that you score right there. But I'm just not seeing any earnings power, anything that's putting these stocks up right now. Instead, I'm seeing cost cutting everywhere and closures everywhere and earnings misses everywhere. But I hope, I hope that, you, that you hit it. Maybe you will. You know, when I talk like this, 
I'm just sharing my own personal opinion of what I think. I'm not trying to tell you guys to do anything. I, I mean, how you trade is is how you trade, right? Don't let me get in the way of your own your own trading. I just share what my thoughts are. Kevin uh, Vaughn, good, good question. Correlation between relative strength and volume. Um, relative, relative strength and volume, they're two separate things. The, the reason the relative strength breaks out ahead of the price is the relative performance of the price of the stock versus the overall market. So what we had for those stocks that I showed you, the work and team and Chegg was probably like that and, and, and Viva Systems and a whole host of other names. The reason the relative strength of those disruptive growth stocks were breaking out is because the market was crashing, but those stocks were not going down as much. So the relative strength is breaking out. It's got nothing to do with volume. Okay. So um, the best time to find these relative strength breakouts are during market corrections. As the market's going down, which stocks are going down relatively less? And those relative strengths start going up. And why are they going down less? Because institutions are protecting their positions. Institutions are defending their positions and buying the stocks as they come down so they don't drop as much as the market. And that gives you a little insight into where institutions are going to go when the market turns. And that's why that works. So that works best during market corrections. When you're in an established bull market, it's hard to find relative strengths that break out. You know, but they still happen. They still happen. All right. Um, I'm worried about CTSD and ACB going bankrupt. I'd be worried too, politics for dummies. I'd be worried too. I think CTSD is going to go bankrupt. But I take that back. Why are you worried? Hopefully you don't own the stocks. So what difference does it make? In fact, I totally take it back. I hope they go bankrupt because that'll make the path so much easier for canopy growth. We need to see bankruptcies. We need to see grow go down, inventory go down, and then the last guy standing will be the greatest investment because we still believe in the long-term picture of cannabis as an investment theme. I would bet, I would bet a high-profile bankruptcy would mark the bottom in these stocks. And you'll start to see relative strength, not versus the market, but versus all the other stocks in the group. I bet you'd already see that now in canopy growth because they got the cash, they got the management team, they're getting their expenses in line and they're going to be cash flow positive, hopefully by the end of the year. So it'll start to relatively outperform and that'll start to attract institutional capital when they feel it's time to own cannabis names. So I wouldn't fear that. Um, Okay, that would hurt MJ a lot. Well, I, we don't own MJ. Hopefully you don't own MJ. This is not a time to own the ETF. This is a time to own the best of breed and actually use the ETF to hedge it. That's the best pair trade. But to be Truth be told, there's a pair trade for you. People talk about pair trades. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm, this is just what institutions do and hedge funds do. You hear hedge funds pair trading. I don't pair trade. But this is a classic pair trade. You get long canopy growth because they've got the cash and the management team. And you short MJ. And the relative outperformance that I'm talking about, the relative strength of canopy outperforming MJ gives you the spread. So even if the short goes up, canopy goes up more. And in some cases, canopy goes up and MJ goes down. Um, these opportunities are gone. And yeah, opportunities are totally gone in team and work and Chegg. That's right. You have to be an armor insider to own those things correctly. I mean, look, just for the fun of it, because you because you give me this opportunity to talk about it again. The time to own Slack was back here at $23.73 when we added it to the armor portfolios on the 8th of April. Guys, if you want to be part of it, subscribe. It was right there. And actually, I might have come on this show and told you that the secondary Slack raised money. I think it was $750 million secondary. And that drove the stock right down to the buy point. We bought weakness in the overall strong pattern, and now we're getting paid. So, 
you know, I would love to share other ideas that I'm buying right now, but that's for Armor Insiders. All right, Slumber's A. I'll always be a slumber. <laughs> Green Ghost. It's a great company. And truth be told, I had a, um, we have a, an Armor Insider who um, uh, is a, He's um, in the energy space. He's a Texan, okay? And he kind of reminded me. I kind of forgot about this. Schlumber Day is doing a ton of business right now capping wells. They're an oil service company. They make money when they cap the well. Then they make money when they uncap the well. So, you know, it could be a great investment with a stout dividend. I think it could be, is it 7%? I can't remember right now, but it's something, something ridiculous like that. What do I think about ACB? I don't like ACB, and they just announced a reverse split, 12 for one. Guys, that's totally cosmetic. Please don't get suckered in by that. It's a cosmetic reverse split. It raises the price and reduces the share count, okay, because they've been puking out shares on shareholders for so long with these ridiculous secondary offerings that it drove the price down so low that they want to put the stock up. Part of why they do that is they hope that the stock will trade higher and it attracts more capital. This is something people don't realize about penny stocks, but institutions will never buy a penny stock. Okay, and real investing dollars, I mean investing, not trading, not day trading, not swing trading, but real investing dollars are put to work long term and institutions, many of them, are not allowed to buy stocks that trade below 10 this is why sometimes you see a stock go above 10 and it pops because the, the, the investing capital liquidity is like a, I guess, an upside down triangle. Okay, all of the massive liquidity, the institutional dollars at the top of that triangle. So at the very bottom of that triangle is money that can buy penny stocks. And the more, the, the higher the price goes, more and more money is allowed to buy the asset. Literally, there's institutions that can't buy stocks below a certain price. And so if you're trying to follow the armor investing way and get on stocks as institutions come in, you almost never want to own something, you know, below 10. But I do it anyway, but I'm just saying. Okay, so they did a reverse split. I don't like the stock. I've never liked the stock. All right. Anyone have junior minor recommendations? <laughs> Brandon, man, you're killing me. Thank you, Brett. You, um, honorable, I appreciate the insight. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate that. CCP would like, oh, <laughs> politics for them. The CCP would not like that, Brett. Right, that's right. You lost 100 social <laughs> credit points for calling it the Wuhan virus. That's what it is. Oh my goodness. We live in such a ridiculously politically whatever correct, incorrect world. It drives me insane. It's called the Spanish flu. I'm surprised the Spaniards haven't gone on some type of massive you know, campaign on social media to change that flu in 1918 to the 1918 flu. Uh, COVID-19, COVID-1918 instead of the Spanish flu or whatever. Wouldn't be COVID, of course. Um, Garrett. You touched on this briefly, but what are your thoughts on REITs generally and NRZ in particular with the economy opening and people going back to work? NRZ, let's take a look. Garrett, nice to see you, my friend. Glad you joined. New residential, all right, all right. Um, there's new residential. Again, it's, it falls into that UAL category or Schlumberger category. It's, it's, a, it's a dividend payer. It's a REIT. I'm not sure we're far enough along yet, Garrett, to know if the dividends are real for the REITs, even though the economy is reopening. I'm having a hard time figuring out what actually is going to be the, um, the dividend payout. So I feel more comfortable in a Schlumberger, for instance, if we're looking at apples to apples here and we, we put some capital aside in the portfolio for these type of investments, 
I'd rather do energy investments where I think the dividend is, is secure, more secure. I mean, none of these dividends are secure, but if you follow the, the theory that the economy is going to open faster than we thought, that would suggest energy prices have hit a floor and should go higher. Um, that means that the dividend on Schlumberger is probably legit. Meanwhile, I don't know how many more months rents will be deferred. So I guess that's how I look at that right now. I'm still not a big fan of, of REITs at the moment. But that does show you the power of IIPR, right? I mean, look at where that stock's trading. All these other REITs have been destroyed. And this stock is trading relatively flat since last year. I mean, really flat with very little downside. We're going to have to look very closely at this. There you go, Brandon. There you go. You want an idea where we've got at the top of the whiteboard? You got one out of me. There it is. All right. Thoughts on Kronos 1.2 cash position. Millhouse. Millhouse, I, I, I know they've got a big cash position, but they keep uh, coming out with ridiculous earnings. I mean, they, they just can't figure out how to get this business working. And so I love the cash position, but I hate the management team. Okay. And one of my basic rules of investing is that investing is about people. You know, you and I are talking about investing. It's about people. You have to trust and believe in the people you're working with. It's no different for CEOs of companies. And I just don't trust these guys. They can't figure it out. So the day they announced that CEO's fired and an Altria person has been put in charge is the day I'd be considering buying the stock. Albert, I really appreciate those comments. Um, um, let's see. Oh yeah, Albert, look at the violin. It's actually, a, it's, I got a cello in the background and, um, and my guitar in the background. My wife, by the way, is the cellist. A very, very good cellist, I'm proud to say. Um, let's see, anything else here? How about, I'm about to wrap up, guys. Last questions, here we go. S-E-D-G or K, it is cannabis mode. All right, James Gregory, I'm going to have to take a look at those two stocks, okay? So um, check back in the comments section. I will, I will tell you, um, I'll look at those stocks and make some comments. Just ask me the comment, I'll respond to it, okay? Solar tech. Solar tech, yeah. All right, let me take a look at the solar stocks. I haven't done a lot of work on them. I'll take a look. All right, guys, um, that wraps it up for today. I really appreciate your time. Any questions that I missed now that I shut off, just Put some comments in the comment section and I'll respond to them, okay? And I look forward to seeing you guys again on Monday, 4.30. We'll do an Armor Investing um, education video. Not exactly sure what I'm going to cover right now, but if you have some thoughts or something you'd like for me to talk about on Monday at 4.30, make a comment. Say, hey, for the Monday show about, Armor, about investing education, could you go over this, okay? And I'll look at a bunch of things you say and We'll put together a nice show for you. All right, guys. You have a great weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Take care.